Welcome to Go Figure. My name is Nadeem Makarin, CEO and founder of Gojek, Southeast Asia's first super app. Gojek does ride hailing, food delivery, payments, even on demand massages. You name it, we do it. Go Figure is a podcast dedicated to expose the inner workings of ambitious tech companies in the emerging world. We like to talk about things we like and talk about things we don't like. There are a lot of myths out there that we want to dispel, so keeping it real is kind of our mantra. Hope you enjoy it. All right, guys, welcome to the first ever episode of Go Figure. Happy to have you guys here. Happy to be uh, here. Likewise, excited. It's awesome. Um, I'm, the, I'm Nadim Makarim. I'm the CEO of Gojek. For the listeners uh, that do not know us, we are a, a super app company in Indonesia, um, largest tech company in the country, um, and now in various other countries in Southeast Asia. I want to just do a quick introduction. We've got the president of Gojek, here, Andre. Uh, we go a long way back. Represent. <laughs> Andre was the first ever uh, investor in Gojek that decided he was uh, just doing way too much work uh, for one of his portfolio companies and just decided to join in as yep. our president. And Andre handles all kinds of strategic partnerships, overall strategy and fundraising, uh, and a bunch of functional organizations in the organization. We got Kevin here, our co-founder and leading all things product uh, in the organization, particularly our core services in mobility and food. Uh, we go even longer way back. We were <clears> friends <throat> before. We worked together in Rocket Internet right. um, in Zalora here in Indonesia. And then uh, uh, I, I, I believe I poached you twice. That is correct. Is that right? That is uh, correct. I poached you twice. <laughs> Last and you, time. And you regret it both times. Last, right? Every day. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, and, and now we're here, uh, maybe we should talk a little bit about why we decided to start this podcast, right? Sure. At least from my side, um, people were getting very excited about some of the talks we were doing or lectures or seminars, but I felt that they weren't getting the nitty gritty of it all. They weren't getting the inside look, they weren't getting the unfiltered mm -hmm. kind of uh, insights to what we learned. And so I guess that's why this first episode, I really wanted us to focus on the biggest mistakes that we made on our path to becoming a Decacorn, mm -hmm. right? Because people always talk about like why you succeed, why you're good, and what are the strengths that led you here, but people don't really talk about the mistakes you made. Very often, they are much more important mm -hmm. in your trajectory. Mm -hmm. So I'll kick it off with that, and uh, maybe Kevin, start up. You had a few points you wanted to bring oh, up. Oh, about, about Specifically about the podcast, or about the podcast. Why, why let's, podcast? Let's start about the okay. podcast first. Yeah, I think you know, I, uh, I kind of echoing you know what, what what you said. I I think that you know the, the industry has a lot of bullshit. Uh, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of people who um, I think in in especially like when you go on these conference tracks, like people are always there's an agenda, right? They're, we're trying to sell the company. We're trying to sell the individual. You know whatever it is, and, and and oftentimes you know it comes off as you mentioned, like you know too polished, not real, um, and and I, generic, and generic, yeah, yeah, way too generic, exactly, exactly, and I do think that, um, I don't know, like I'm sure both of you can kind of agree with this. There's a lot of people who kind of go to you personally for like advice, right? Like, oh, what, how did you guys do this? And, and that, and, and and those moments when you kind of like stand there, like you know, on a one-on-one -on -one or in like a closed group setting. It's probably when you give the best advice, right? Yep. Realistically, right? Um, and 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 I think that you know having this format uh, kind of expands this, you know, beyond the people who can personally reach out, you know, to to us. And I think it doesn't mean that you know we're so special or anything like that. But you know, we've I feel like we've really lucked out, kind of getting to you know where we are, uh, and we've had a lot of unique opportunities to kind of learn and grow that you know others might not have had the experience yet to. And I, I love the fact that you, we can kind of have very unfiltered, unstructured, um, not very well planned conversations around a topic that you know we all have unique experience around. So I, and going forward, like you know, having more uh, other guests kind of talk in the same way, I think is is, is, is super exciting. I think. Yeah. Uh, so so likewise, I think the uh, so we we all forget that you know this region is from a technology standpoint is relatively very new, right? So that 
I think you know all of us are so excited about the future of the you know region uh, overall. So obviously, hopefully, with this openness, kind of unfiltered, you know, uncensored kind of conversation, people will really understand what is kind of the common pitfalls and really like strategize what's really important for their own entrepreneurship going forward so that we can actually help build the ecosystem together because otherwise you know all of us are busy with our day-to-day -day, you know going to conferences and meet like you know people one one by one it's not scalable so this is probably one of the most scalable way and hopefully we can also attract other people other great founders our great great management team even like people from outside to just come here and really like share their, um, you know, some of their, you know, interesting points, so that we can actually make this much more uh, collaborative, uh, you know, effort going and, forward. And, and I think that you know a lot of these discussions about about uh, specifically about tech unicorns as well, they often take the perspective of like developed markets, yeah. right, yeah. and global leaders. So we're talking like Silicon Valley yeah. uh, and of course China. China. But no one's really talking about these these emerging unicorns. Yeah. and in the emerging economies where the infrastructure is so qualitatively different. Like there's so many more things broken in the emerging world that technology has, I think, an even bigger leapfrog effect, right? But because of that also, the mistakes are also way more dramatic that yeah. we make, right? And are, are so much more visible. So hopefully by discussing some of these mistakes, we can, uh, get people to experience more, learn something, and maybe will learn something from these discussions as well. Dude, I think, it's, I think that that point is really important, actually, that um, a lot of the literature and the knowledge has mostly come out of the US and now starting yeah. to come out of China. Um, and just looking at the US and China, you can see that there are these huge companies that have kind of come out of these ecosystems, and yet the knowledge that you get is very different, right? So there's no, yeah. I, I, think, I think on that same note, you know, the same would should be able to be said about companies that come out of this region, and dude, like, I think I, I I think you know some of the challenges that we've dealt with are, are definitely uh, not uh, ones where we can just copy paste learnings from the U.S. and from China. Yeah. Can. And, and remember that it's also a unique problem for a lot of companies in in our space, like emerging market tech, is actually we also need to face actually the global giants that wants to go into our market. So the uniqueness is not just about how to deal with our local problems, but also how to actually compete against the best of the best. Which is super crazy, right? I think we, we mentioned this a few times, like at, at one point our, uh, the, our a competitor that we had to go against, you know, their junior engineer made more money than the CEO of our company, you know, like in terms of salary. And just to show that, that discrepancy of, of both capability and funding, but still, we're seeing emerging unicorns succeed in their own right, and some of them are actually kicking ass, yep. right? Uh, I think yep. a lot of them are kicking ass. Very uh, much. And we, we don't know exactly why. We have some hypotheses of why this, these local players are really kind of dominating, but maybe in the discussion today. So let's talk about mistakes, guys. Yep. Mistakes. What do we mess up on? I think, I think we, we have like <laughs> a few unique situations that might or might not be well, I think it's relatable, but probably the pace, right? I think, you know, we, we went from, you know, we launched our app in January 2015, uh, right? And, um, you know, we had like, I think like 40 to 50 employees at the time. Uh, and now we, we have more than 3,000, right? And it's only been like three, three. under four years, right? Yeah. Uh, it's been under four years, Yeah, so right? for the listeners that don't know, our app launched January 1st, 2015. Yes. So yeah. we're a four-year-old company. January 15th. Sorry, January 15th, my bad. Yes, yes, January yes, 15th. yes. yes. And it's kind of crazy. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's insane, right? But, uh, and, and obviously, most companies will not experience that level of hyper growth. Uh, and you know, we had that in a very compressed time frame. But I do think that a lot of, scale, a lot of scaling an organization, uh, uh, um, the knowledge of how to scale an organization, I think, uh, uh, was missing. And we made a lot of mistakes as a result of that. I think one. I, look, you know, we'll, we'll kind of go through a lot of these, but I think one one area that I think was particularly problematic, um, and I think we're still dealing with today, is uh, communication, mm -hmm. internal communication, um, and and this covers many things, right? Like I think at the very highest level, it can be something as simple as uh, communicating what is the mission of the company and what's what are the top priorities for the company. You know, we have. 
And we should have done this when we had 100 employees, because even at 100 people, keeping 100 people focused on the same thing is already a challenge, right? And now we have like thousands of people across uh, multiple countries. And, and, and I think you know, we underinvested in this infrastructure. And so something very as simple as just, okay, this is the mission of the company and this is what's important. I think just having a way to communicate that effectively and consistently and knowing that everyone under, is on the same page, I think it's something that you know, we, we definitely underinvested in. And I think as a result, you know, every uh, senior management team in a startup uh, that has more than 100 people will say, oh, I have alignment issues. I think that's a pretty universal thing. Like everyone will say, yeah. to some degree, we have. What, what does that mean, though? What right. what what does alignment issues mean? I I keep hearing yeah. this all the time. Sure. Like I feel like we're not aligned. If it, I feel like there is a, a a more specific thing that people are trying to get at when they say we're not aligned or when teams are not aligned. Do they feel excluded? Mm -hmm. Do they feel it's too top down? What what are the real consequences of communication failure? So I think the alignment, alignment area is, 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 I mean, there's, there's many, but I think if you specifically want to want to get into alignment, uh, alignment kind of means that, uh, so these, these usually come up when A, there are dependencies, right? So uh, let's say uh, team A uh, wants to uh, launch a critical new feature that they think is really important for the success of you know, the specific team or product that this team resides in, right? Um, and then it turns out, that um, there is a dependency uh, to launch that feature uh, because there's another kind of maybe infrastructural piece uh, or an operational piece uh, that needs to get done well in order for team A to have a successful launch. Um, and so the communication of what's important allows for that alignment to happen, right? So, so for example, if everyone knows that, hey, feature A is a key part of the company's vision, and the key part of the company's strategy, then if that is drilled into the heads of every single person, then that alignment issue becomes much easier because then there's a reference point that team A can say, hey, guys, um, this is, you know, we all know that the company is gunning for X this mm. year. Um, and because we're gunning for X, I'm working on Y, please help me launch Y. And in a way, if everyone is aligned and executing based on that strategy, Either they're already kind of working on a, a, a working on that thing, right, on that feature, or getting buy-in to support that feature is something that. And so, be what what were we doing before? Before we were just simply thinking, all right, here are the features that we need to get out. Right. Here's what I believe is most important for this product, for this product, for this functional org, etc. Mm -hmm. But we weren't actually we didn't have this overall company vision document, mm -hmm. right. and we didn't. We, well, it's embarrassing to say this, yeah. but for a while yeah. we were operating without company-wide OKRs. Yeah, no, right? no company-wide planning tool. There was right. no planning tool that everyone could rally around, yeah. right? And so, so the consequences of that is that people were constantly feeling shafted mm -hmm. because their priorities were not being uh, heard, yeah. right? Yeah. They were getting, so then this became this whole dogma of top-down. Yeah. Oh God, we're so top-down, right? And it, it, because that was the only way to get it done. Exactly. Right? Somebody, somebody senior has to say, oh, do this, do this, do this. And they would fix alignment issues on a point by point basis rather than having everyone kind of rally towards the same direction. Right? Yeah. There's a, it became a lot more necessary for people like you know, the people talking right now to get involved. Uh, because if we didn't get involved, they would just squabble and it was unclear like, why should we work on this? I think one of the, uh, I mean, just to kind of put it a different perspective into this. Sometimes there's a lot of mistakes, especially early stage, yeah. uh, between setting up what is a business vision versus a product vision. And the reason why I said that is because I think we all, especially because we're all like first time doing this or second time doing this, you don't know what you well, don't know. First time the scale. Yeah, first time at scale. I mean, yeah. most most of any most of like uh, founders or management team in this part of the world's first time doing that as well. Sometimes you are getting bought in into this business ideas that's very consultant like, if you may. Mm. Like, oh, this one is big. That mm. one is big. The TAM is super huge. Can you, can you explain that? Well, like what? Like we see another company doing successfully yes. on one service. The easiest way. I mean, in China, it's always the case, right? In China, or, there's or this company, yeah. or in, in the US, yeah. there's this company that does this. It's super huge. Yeah. It could like, reach to like this many billions of dollars. And, and, and this is what they've been doing, like 10 different features that they do. Yeah. And suddenly, you're actually not 
uh, you know, creating something that a differentiation, becoming that silver lining on how you actually engage with your customer or businesses that you serve. But then you are actually chasing businesses. And hence, as, as a result, sometimes the prioritization of what companies do follows that business logic, which doesn't really recipro you know, reciprocate with kind of the uh, how do you actually create alignment from a product standpoint. I mean, you know, like at the early days, we actually had maybe a ballot, well, a little bit more to business-like, uh, if you may, but with the luck that actually some of the products that we do has a silver lining uh, to it, right? I mean, you know, number one is obviously how we actually use drivers, our driver, you know, our driver base to actually do many different products that we have. But it's actually, if you think about it, it wasn't by design. No. Yeah, it was and by a little bit of luck. A lot, a lot, a of, lot of luck. It's mostly luck. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly. I just want to be. A little bit we, we, can have, of course. We, we can have a whole podcast <laughs> just on the role of luck as well. Exactly. But no, I love what you said about that because honestly, I think a lot of entrepreneurs at different stages of their development um, and their personal journey often focus on successful use cases elsewhere. So they're chasing, exactly what you said, chasing businesses as opposed to chasing problems. Yes. Problems, yes. right? And, and problems can, can, can exist without first a business model, right? If, but if you can crack, generally speaking, what Gojek has found throughout its whole history is that if you can crack a fundamental user problem, you will find a way to monetize it exactly. sooner or later. You will find it, and that's very true. I think I think a lot of uh, the dogma out of Silicon Valley was very correct about this. That first chase the problem, and then revenue kind of comes in. But of course, it depends on which stage of the company. I think we did make a lot of mistakes where we're just like, okay, we see that that's successful. Let's gun for that yeah. instead of is this really solving a fundamental problem for our user base? And when we started looking at products from that problem centric approach, we noticed conversion to that product exponentially increasing yeah. right and and, we, and once you actually I mean I like the word every time to use the word of decoupling right uh, because any problems if you decouple it then you can see each which area that you want to focus on and really like create that you know 10x experience uh, to kind of solve the problems of the customer and then you work your way on the other areas that that combine becomes a, the best experience right uh, because if, if you know, because th that's that's actually what you know is common mistakes that is being done. You see one product as a whole holistic problem, and hence you know sometimes it becomes like all over the place, right? You you don't focus on very specific things that are relatable to your customer yet, and yet you actually expand your uh, time spent resources to actually go pretty wide uh, unnecessarily. Right. Uh, and, and through decoupling, you can also then have a sense that how you can actually play your role in the ecosystem. You can partner with someone else that solves the other part of that problem. Right. And holistically, then you create a very strong uh, okay. product but as what a whole. About, what about yeah. the counter argument? Sure. There's a counter argument here to saying that there are some products that get released out there that seem to solve a, a specific problem, but structurally there is no way to make net revenue out of it. It's really difficult. I mean, you see a lot of startups face this problem as well. So what do you say to that? Is that because they're just structuring the problem differently? Like for example, when we launched GoMart, you know, we, we kind of struggled with how to monetize a service like that, but quite a few people were using it. But if we are you know, dependent on like, for example, retailers that also already have thin margins, we were not able to generate net revenue. So how do you, how do you respond to the challenge that if you don't think of the business model in the beginning, then how do you expect to create a sustainable business at the end? That's actually where uh, it's very important to focus on what you are as a company and your kind of key core strength that you wanted to deliver, right? In the GoMart example, that very clearly that the O2O model doesn't really work mm. unless you actually do two things, right? One is if you do your own retail, uh, B2C, right. like Amazon Fresh, or you actually go very deep into the advertising and brand advertising model to actually uh, build them. But, and we made a decision, uh, if you're, you know, like that we are not both of that company because our value prop is using our marketplace of drivers to create the fastest O2O market. So then, you know, decided to actually shut it down, right? But 
if our core proposition is retail, you know, really like focusing on logistics and fulfillment of goods, then that might be a, a different way to think about it. it may, mm. they might, they, that might, might actually work for other, other businesses that actually focus on that, right? right. Uh, and obviously companies grow. Eventually could actually, you could also you know, consider that, but obviously at that stage we were, you know, that's not priority because that doesn't serve our core value propositions. I'd like to slightly pivot right now, um, where we've been talking about market strategy and, and, and generally a product strategy. I'd like to turn a little bit and talk about people strategy and perhaps sure. some of the mistakes that we might have made. And I want to kick it off by, I think for me, one of the, one of the biggest lessons learned I had was, I mean, you were there from the beginning with me. At, I think in the beginning, we really treated engineering as a factory, right? Engineering yeah. was this factory of, yes, they're very smart. It's a very smart factory, but they were still a factory. They executed the product vision of the founders, right. essentially. And for a while, that's what happened. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, uh, over time, we, we quickly hit the limits by which we could actually scale that system as, as, uh, as founders who are not technical mm -hmm. in nature. Um, and I, I, I think that you know, one of the biggest learnings for me personally was that engineering is not a production center. It is not a cost center. It is, in fact, a value generative center, mm -hmm. which means that harnessing the creative, the collective creativity of an engineering department is one of the most powerful forces that, to be honest, we did not harness in the beginning because we had that mindset. And it slowly changed with, mm -hmm. but what, what, what do you think changed that? Is it, is it because we started getting superstars uh, in the engineering department that, that changed our mind and said, and, and, and kind of pushed back on us and said, wait a minute, we're thinking of this the wrong way. What, what, what do you think happened there in, in that transition? I think uh, that's why I think it, it actually ties back to what we were, we were talking about on, on communication, right? I think, uh, I think a lot of the pushback that we got was that, hey, give me outcomes you would like, right? right? Uh, rather than just, rather than telling me what to do, you know, you know, tell me what are we doing and why, uh, and then let me figure out the way to get there, right? And I think uh, it, it's very... Do you think that's only true for engineering, no. or is that applicable Everyone. to most high-performing teams and I think departments? At the end of the day, you know, if you want to hire, recruit, and retain the best talent, they need to feel like they are creating value, right? And I think there's only, uh, 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 I think for the most part, you know, the, if you are looking for smart, ambitious people and you want them to be here, uh, you need to provide them a platform to really create um, and rather than kind of just execute someone else's thing. Um, and I think, you know, we kind of value having people who have an entrepreneurial mindset here. I think culturally, um, even though we didn't think about it consciously, culturally we tend to resonate with people yeah. who have you know, a certain entrepreneurial mindset. And as a result, we got a lot of people who are like that. And as a result, when we were at that phase, when we were literally saying, I have 80 features and I want 80 features all out in the next three to six months, um, it kind of, you know, for somebody who is entrepreneurial, it seemed like you know, it's almost the opposite of what they would be looking for. And as a result, like you said, you know, they, they, they push back. Um, uh, they pushed back and um, you know we didn't really we kind of like struggled to kind of get to a better place and that's kind of uh, honestly like some of the things that you know we are talking about on just internal people issues I think I think again uh, I, I, I would like to talk a lot more about you know communication later on because I think communication is kind of the the, the root it's not a root cause of the problem it's a uh, uh, it is one of the it's it's one of the things that will help us solve this problem because without very good uh, communication infrastructure, how do we unleash all of these people that 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 are clamoring uh, 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 to have their ideas heard? That's super fascinating, right? So so communication is not just a tool for alignment. Communication, what we've learned yeah. over time, is communication is actually what unleashes bottom-up innovation yeah, and right, creativity. Yeah, right. yeah. And why is that, right? What is the mechanism 
by which that, that works. The mechanism is that if you give a set of broad generic targets or direction mm. to a team, then they are able, they know the problem closer, right. they're closer to the problem than you are. Yeah. So what they're able to do is like, okay, if the company wants to hit that target or the company wants to go into that direction, then these are the things based on my intimate knowledge of the yes. problem mm -hmm. that can contribute most to that target. Yes. So at, you're hitting many things yes. at one time. You're creating uh, freedom and autonomy mm -hmm. to decide which features or which things to build, which initiatives to build that can contribute to that. You're creating agency. Yes, ownership. You're creating a sense of, yeah. I'm actually yeah. contributing through my own mm -hmm. ideation, through my own creativity towards the company target. And then thirdly, it's also giving them a sense of trust. like. Because, because we're not telling them how to get there. We're telling them where we need to go, mm -hmm. but not how to get there. So I think a lot of people assume communication is like some kind of admin role yeah. in an organization, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. It's some kind of a, uh, okay, we need to do newsletters, we yeah. need to do yeah. tracking, we need to do this, we need to do like a oh, mission, vision. It's, it's not just that, it's actually building the framework by which ideas can scale up. And that is why communicate with purpose is one of our values, right? Mm -hmm. And I think in many ways we, we did it really honor it as highly as, as, as we should. Uh, but I do think you know, that's why it's important. And, and, and for people who are first starting out, um, I, I, it's never obvious, right? Like you know, when we were all you know, sitting in a room uh, and like, with like 30, 40 people, it's not really that necessary, right? Yeah. Because there is so much of that context that comes out. Like even if we don't communicate in words, in emails, in like, you know, structure. Know yeah, yeah. People yeah. know what's going on. People know why it's important, right? Just by overhearing conversations even, right? But, and, right. but, but once you scale beyond like 100 people, how, how do you kind of, you know, do that? Like, and, and, and that's why, like, it, it's like on one hand, um, on one hand, you know, I think founders tend to have like this allergy towards bureaucracy, right? And there's kind of like, oh, all that stuff that is bureaucratic is, 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 is not good. Which, you know, I think, I think is, is an okay mentality to have, but I think it, there comes a point when you have to realize that there are tools uh, and, and processes and mindsets that are necessary in order for your organization to maintain hyper growth in a way that is healthy. Let's, let's talk about these tools. Let's talk sure. about these tools. Like what are these specific tools that we actually implemented kind of late, right? Yeah. We wish we implemented them earlier. Yeah. That actually uh, 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 transformed how we operate as as a much larger organization. I think obviously OKRs, right? Like we're we're like in our well, year year one year of one. really. Okay, um, yeah, we should probably explain a little bit OKR what OKR is, just generically. Yeah, well, generically, right? I mean, they stand for objectives and and, and key results, and they're. Kind of, they were popularized by, by Google in reality, and it's kind of been one of the main planning tools, I would say, for most technology companies, and actually non-technology companies as well. Uh, and essentially what it does is, you know, you have an objective, which is kind of like a mission uh, uh, that, you know, let's say, uh, let's say, you know, Gojek wanted to get into social. Right. Um, well, let's use this podcast as, as an example. Sure. Let's use yeah. this podcast. Like, <laughs> like, right? Let's like, get I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, like if we if we think about the overarching like mission of 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 this podcast is to provide a platform where people can share learnings uh, uh, that are relevant to building a technology company in Southeast Asia. Right. right. That's kind or of like, emerging markets or emerging markets in general. Yeah. Right. Um, and then we can set some, you know, some objectives and key results about, okay, that's the mission, right? So, you know, what are we going to focus on for the first three months of this podcast? So let's call it the Q1 Go Figure OKRs, okay, right. Q1 2019 OKRs, right? Like one is just, hey, we're just getting off the ground right now, right? So maybe uh, there could be an objective around just hygiene on quality, right? Like how good is the audio? Uh, uh, how good is like the video content? And so maybe you can say an objective could be Offer a, offer a world class, po um, podcast media experience, right. right? And that could be something around you know, uh, video quality, like some right. key results. So key result has to be quantitative. Yeah. So right? that's the objective, and then subset key result. Right. So key result is like uh, uh, reliability of microphone sound. Correct. Yeah. Availability or percentage of static sound yes. visible, right? And all these other things. Okay. Right. Yeah, so production quality. Yeah. Right. So right. we have a mission. Right, but because it's our first quarter, maybe we should just focus on hygiene, right? So maybe hygiene objective one is just the media quality, bunch of key results, quantitative ways to track 
the quality of the, the yeah. media that we're pushing. Another objective could be around uh, a guest pipeline, right? Right. right. Build a yeah. guest pipeline for the first year. Or another objective is because we also need to make sure that it actually attracts pretty good audience. Mm -hmm. It's like you know, experimenting engagement the metrics. Enga engagement metrics that leads to distribution <laughs> yeah. channels, right? You know, yeah. like how many views, how many like referrals and whatnot. Yeah. yeah. So that's. That's a little bit about kind of our mistakes in, 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 in not investing up early in communication, not investing up early in, in target and alignment documents like yes. OKRs. Um, I, I want to kind of uh, uh, talk about talent acquisition a mm. little bit because, mm. um, you know, I think in, in the beginning, one of the things is when, when you don't have enough funding, mm. right, in mm. the beginning, when you are funding constrained, there is always this dilemma that founders have and senior management teams have about do you get a good enough person that can allow you to execute quickly right now mm. even when you know that that person may not be able to scale mm. uh, when the company grows or do you gun for upfront investment of uh, of really top talent mm. uh, and sacrifice budget mm. Uh, but knowing that that person can scale. This is, a, this is a huge dilemma that I think a lot of people are interested in yep. about how much should startups and at what stage invest early in world-class talent? Mm. Mm. So, mm. I, mean, uh, I mean, there's, there's no, um, unfortunately this is where there's no a silver bullet that, you know, that's right or wrong, but if, if we have to learn from our uh, past experience, obviously invest upfront in world-class people will actually be the, the um, my preference um, and the reason being is that because sometimes there's also this mentality uh, of founders or early senior management they, they, they always say that I can I can do these things as well you know this is not very important I can do that I can do that as well I can fundraise while I lead the company while I go meet the government while I actually handle the engineering team I mean, marketing. and do marketing. Yeah, that's like me doing. Then, he, this is like me being head of engineering and him being CFO. <laughs> exactly. In the early phase, which is kind of ridiculous if you think about which, it now. Which I think, uh, um, unfortunately, a lot of people will face that because it's not easy to attract talents at the early stage because you know until you prove it out. But that that aspiration and knowing that if you can find people can, that can replace some of your function with hundred x or ten x better. That actually will immediately help on ways to execute the company better because at the end of the day, it was it was always trained to kind of get collective great people in the room, which reduces kind of the burden early on on uh, certain sets of function, which is basically uh, creating inefficiencies uh, in the way that uh, you know founders or you know senior leadership is actually executing. So that's actually. So is that is that is that paradigm of the ten x talent? Yes. Have you do you fully believe in that? Is that just a cliche, or is that really? No. Is it worth really one great person is really worth ten okay people? Exactly. And that has applied in, in all. I know that you've recently kind of like done this experiment with a legal team mm -hmm. and and with several other functional organizations in in Gojek and found great success, right? Yeah particularly on how it scaled you. Yes. Right, can you talk a little bit about that? Like what was the impact to you as a, a senior leadership, um, essentially another co-founder in the organization, like what, what impact did it have to your ability to perform? First of all, we, you know, we all need to recognize that any of us, again, given that we're doing this first time, we're not the best at everything, right? So immediately you'll see that people that has really like key focus in certain functions, uh, when, when they actually perform, will do much better job because they either come from an experience of relevant background to that function or people that has actually experience in like other companies that has similar problems. So that's first. Number two is most importantly, I mean we all as senior leadership of this crazy growth companies, you know, have only so much time to think about everything, right? You, you, you always think that, oh, you know, if we have more time that we can do this. Uh, so, so in reality, that time saving for people to actually focus on what really matters, uh, especially also allowing uh, senior leadership to also care about the other people part, right? Because, uh, you know, you'll see that later on, 
as company grows, culture and people is actually one of the very, very key important metrics that as leaders needs to actually put, put together. Uh, then all that time that you can actually have to then uh, spend, uh, spend your time on the really great things um, will actually be established once we actually, you can actually get great people to replace some of your function. In my case, um, I used to be, um, I used to be, I used to replace Kevin as the CFO. You know, probably five percent better job. <laughs> is my guess. At least. At least. <laughs> Around there. About. But then, as you know, it's, as a CFO, it handles all the back end of finance and accounting and tax. Also handles corp, you know, corporate finance activities, fundraise, M and As. Uh, I'm, I'm probably the best lawyer we had. Back in the days. That's so sad. <laughs> That's so sad. I'm actually the government relation guy, you know, <laughs> corporate communication. You know, by, by saying all of that, you already see the faults in the stars, right? Um, and obviously, in the last one year, we're, we're kind of lucky to invite like the best of the best that replace that function. And now I'm thinking about strategy together. Uh, you know, we as a group can now think about strategy what's next? Yeah. How do you align people internally to achieve those strategy? How do you actually put in the right amount of work to build some standard, you know, standard approach uh, to make sure that, that those things are being achieved? And you know, really having the time to kind of think uh, uh, and, and what's, what's next, right? But I think that's why kind of like in the mindset of recruitment, in the beginning, we were kind of like, let me find the smartest people who can execute something that I tell them to do, who has yeah. a lot of discipline, a lot of smarts, and a lot of... Uh, d uh, uh, basically critical thinking, right? Yep. But as you scale up and the organization scales up, it's extremely important, and I think this is my personal lesson learned, is to start finding people who you think can be better than you yep. at that. And this is a very tough shift because a lot of people see hiring as a subordinate activity instead of people hiring someone to eventually replace them. And for someone to replace them, they have to be they have to have the potential to be better than them. Yes. Right? And so a lot of people say this, and I've heard this mentioned a few times, but it's easier said than done. People consistently do not, leaders consistently do not hire people that are better than them. Yes. And it's a real problem. And yes. some of it has to do with insecurity, mm -hmm. right? Some, a lot of it has to do with yeah. insecurity. A lot of it has to do with, uh, I don't want someone kind of challenging me too much because I'm too busy to have to deal with someone who's opinionated. I just want someone to take this off my back. Yeah, I think, I think, I think what people need to realize is that um, in, a, in a fast growing company, uh, responsibilities expand very quickly. Yep. Um, and, I, and I think that the mistake that I see a lot of, I guess in the way you put it, less secure leaders act is that, okay, um, there are, there's always this question if like you were, let's say, let's say I'm managing somebody and there was another senior person that I was interviewing for a position, uh, uh, and I asked them to kind of help interview, their immediate response is usually like, oh, what does this mean for me in terms of my job security, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and it, it tends to be, the, the more mature ones tend to realize that, look, you know, project out 12, 18 months from today, what is all of this gonna look like, and will I be able to handle this, right? And, and in a fast-growing company, the answer is usually no. Right. Um, and, Almost always. Almost, almost always. always almost, yeah. almost always no, right? And, and, and um, the ones who kind of have that security in knowing that in 12 to 18 months, this is going to be a beast that I cannot handle. And having somebody who is more experienced than me that either I can learn from uh, uh, or can totally take it away from me is actually going to be valuable. And I think people underestimate in these type of environments um, how dynamic someone's career can be, right? Like you'll have people who are, you know, let's say, 15, 20 years of experience report to somebody who has seven years of experience. Um, and these things happen. Uh, uh, these things happen and I think um, one of, I guess, I don't think I have a learning here per se to kind of you know, uh, uh, talk about because I, I still personally struggle with how do I communicate this to people. But I think it generally if people can kind of realize that you know, we're on this crazy rocket ship uh, and there will be enough to go, there will be enough work to go around and, the, and you don't know everything, including ourselves, right? And I think this yeah, is right. part of the reason why I'm excited about doing this podcast is to kind of talk about that, you know, even we don't have anywhere yeah. near all of the answers. And, and, and to your point on, and sorry, this is another segue on like, 
I'd like to offer something like fairly actionable, which is I, I personally, I like to only look at most 18 months, if not 12 months, and kind of when I, we hire, do we hire the first scale or do we hire you know, whatever we can get, like short term versus long term? I think you know, Andre's right in that there's no science per se to it, but the closest I have to a scientific is, let's say, 12 to 18 months. Let's look at this job and this function, this team, whatever it is, and let's project out you know, some period of time, 12 to 18 months, and say, what does this have to be by then, right? It's, 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 you know, it's fairly easier to think about what's gonna happen in 12 months, right, yeah. than, than like three years. Like, is this person gonna scale 100x? Who knows? Because we don't even know what scaling 100x means for that team, right? But we can know, what is next year, roughly? It's so hard though, Kev, because all those CVs that come in, yeah. once you put that litmus test of 12 to 18 months forward, yeah. almost invariably, the large, vast, per majority of that percentage is the answer is no. I, that person I, well, does sure. not, okay. will not be able to hit that. And then you realize, which is maybe a good thing, because sure. you realize then, oh man, I totally underspect yes. the, yes. the yes. Uh, capabilities required for this role. Yeah, right? I, I agree, and, and, but that's why I think it's important to think about it that way and kind of going back to the whole point of setting vision and strategy, Right. If we have a rough sense of what 12 to 18 months looks like now, then we should have somebody today who can execute over that. And in that 12 to 18 month period, we'll evaluate, yeah. like, can this person do the next 12 to 18 yeah, months? Because people grow. People I mean, grow. The, the, yeah. best, the best outcome is you get lucky uh, in getting 5 to 10 percent of those people that you hire for 12 to 18 months to be people that can grow for perpetuity. Mm. Right. I think we've yeah. we've We've actually found really amazing, yeah. you know, people that yeah, first job is Gojek, and turns out he or she is scalable to perpetuity. But we didn't know. We didn't know. Yeah. But but that's but, but that's we knew, a, we knew for the next year you could trust this person. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But so so that's actually just a process. Uh, but if you never took that action, then you will never meet that probability. The other thing that I wanted to bring up in this case as well that sometimes you also then find those people that can be your core leadership group. And the reason why I say this is I think the other part that we never discuss very openly is that, I mean, these types of jobs uh, from a mental health perspective is very demanding, right? It's the fatigue. I mean, the, the best analogy is actually we're all sprinting in the marathon. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you it's always say, analogy. oh man, sprinting, sprinting, you know, you thought that you're gonna, you're gonna like relax. Done in the month. Yeah. yeah? yeah. No, no, no way. It's yeah. sprinting in a marathon, right? Because uh, no one has seen what the. I know. It's kind know. of annoying, and I do it too. I tell people, guys, remember, it's a marathon. But if thinks if someone said that to me, I'd be really pissed off. Exactly. I'm like, unfortunately, I have to sprint during this marathon. No, let's like, let's <laughs> let's realize that upfront, because as founders, as core senior leadership, the mental health is very important because most of the biggest issues, biggest mistakes, biggest decision that needs to be done, and putting a poker face in front of everyone and say everything will be okay, yeah. it's just such a demanding uh, requirement for oh, yeah. everyone. So if you don't have a core leadership group that you can trust and share that burden, that it's together we can solve this, together we can withstand this, it's really hard. It's really hard because that's, that's the other part. I mean, people see this job as very glorified. Nadim's so cool, man. He's so successful. <laughs> you know, I want to be like Nadim. But guess what? Nah. <laughs> it's, not, it's, not a, <laughs> it's not an easy work, right? I mean, everyone's just cursing uh, how, you know, how problematic it is. I mean, the, the good thing is in Gojek, we know one of probably the, the good examples uh, how we actually become who we are is that we have this group, right? I mean, we have an extended group. Uh, people that has the similar mindsets and stuff so we can share the burden together it's not just about one or two or three people that needs to think about those burden it's a collective of very very um, uh, committed people that and wants to share that you know on to that point and talking about this kind of like essentially intimacy at the leadership level right yeah. and and being able to have an authentic almost friendship like well not not almost true friendship yeah I mean we we see each other more than we, we see our, our wives, just by <laughs> hours spent per day, right? So we get pretty close. Um, but this is a really interesting dynamic because when we're talking about mistakes, I don't know if this is a mistake or a gain, but you know, me and Kevin, we used to have a lot of debates about sh 
should leadership team be a sports team or a family? Right, and, and, and I think you were on the, on the sports team side. Yeah. Uh, and, I, I, and I was in the beginning kind of like, okay, it should be family. I think in reality, in my opinion now, I've settled somewhere in the middle. Okay. Right? I've settled what some. What does that mean? I, it means that, that, to Andre's point, that if it's all just about performance and, and picking people who are really good at their job and that you trust, then you, know, you don't build this sense of safety. Yes. Right? And we as humans, we know behaviorally, safety is our number one core requirement for us to perform, be creative, learn, etc. Right? Same with children, same with adults. So the safety, you mean psychological Psychological safety, safety and yeah. being able to say everything that you mean when you mean it, being able to express your feelings, and just, you know, uh, shooting the shit when it, when it matters, right? And being able to, to relax around people. And so I think the best teams operate this thin line between friendship and sports team, like sure. cookie cutter uh, 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 paradigm. Actually, I mean, yeah, you know, actually that works very well in a sports team as well because the best, you know, like say uh, a football team mm. is actually having that chemistry, right? I mean, exactly. Barcelona. I mean, yeah. to give an example, during the golden days, well, between, they grew up together. They grew yeah, up yeah. together, like yeah. Xavi, Iniesta, yeah. 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 or like Manu 97, 99. So, so, so that's actually, I think probably the most, the closest analogy to you know illustrate this. But it should never. So the sports team takes over when, when you do have members that are not scaling, you have to cut. You have oh, to yeah. let them go. What do you think of, of of that, right? Because I think you know, as a as a company. You know, uh, we've kind of tried to settle on like that spectrum of, uh, and, and you know, spectrum of like a super forgiving family to uh, <laughs> an extremely transactional sports team, right? right. Like we've, we've we've kind of tried to find that 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 middle ground. Like how how would you think we've done so far? I think we honestly we don't let go enough of people. I think we've started to do that, but honestly, it's not just us as a very top of the top of the pyramid kind of activity. The, the concept, I always say this, and I've been trying to, it's, it's a little bit controversial, but I've been trying to imbue this paradigm in the team now that good leaders hire superstars. Great leaders constantly refresh their teams. Like, great leaders are defined by their courage and willingness to let go of people. That's a really important, I think, characteristic that we don't imbue enough. It's almost like a taboo sometimes, I feel in many organizations, this concept of letting go of people, which should actually be a, a, a really important part of every leader's evaluation and performance. Like, I don't know why we don't evaluate people and did you let go of people? Because mathematically speaking, you, there's no way you can convince me that people have a 100% success ratio of recruitment. Of course. That makes yeah. no sense to me, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. if, if you're the best recruiters I know and leaders, get it, maybe like 60% sure. of the time, maybe 70% of the time accurate unlikely you're hitting anywhere above that, right? Yeah. Um, so, so I think that's, that's a paradigm that we have not enforced yet uh, in Gojek, that we should be evaluating people just not on the stars they hire, but on how often do they refresh their team and let go of, now here's the thing, letting go of non-performers is very easy, right? If someone is disruptive or they're just not yeah. putting in the work, right, and not achieving anything, then that's easy, right? It's easy to fire an asshole. <laughs> in your organization, there's nothing, you shouldn't get credit for that. What is hard, however, is letting go of people who are okay and still contributing value. And liked. And liked. And liked, yeah. and liked by the organization, mm -hmm. but are obviously not scaling with the organization and the role of that person's need. So that's when the tough decisions need to be had. You either, you have two options. You either let go or you demote. Right. And demotion has a bunch of negative consequences as well to their morale, yeah. self-esteem, etc. So this is the challenge, right? Letting go of people who are still adding value, but just not at the level that is expected of them. And, and that's why I like the, I, I, do like, I, I do really like the sports team analogy, right? Because you know, there will always, uh, again, I, 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 don't, I think there are healthy sports teams, right? Where, where, where that, that sense of like camaraderie is there, and there's very transactional sports teams where it's like, hey, you know, I have an unlimited budget of sp to spend on players, and if you are not the top, like that's it, you're out, right? And uh, but I do think that generally that philosophy, again, you know, uh, the sports team philosophy around 
okay, do you have the best person in the world for this position, right? And in the, the best person in this world isn't not always an objective like measurement of skill set, but it's also like a cultural fit. How do you work together? Yeah. How do they work together with the rest of the team? Yeah. But always setting that bar, and that's I think something I totally agree with you. It's something we also still have a challenge, which is that how do we set that bar of excellence and know that you know when somebody is no longer meeting that bar, then we need to have a plan to either move that person up to, to meet that bar. And if that person fails to do so, then like you said, we need to re lower the bar for them by demotion, so to speak, smaller uh, uh, responsibility, or we ask them to leave. Yeah, right? it's, it's, it's also, um, it's, it's, it's not how talentful an individual is, right? You can be the best striker ever, but if you're not, uh, uh, there's no collaboration with all the other players, if you may, that's not going to work because the chemistry and how you actually work together is not going to you know, create the, the productivity, if you may, to actually achieve on the results, which is winning, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so basically, it's not, it's not just about the, the, the most smart people to mm -hmm. actually, you know, uh, get that position, because, uh, you know, I think that how they collaborate with each other will probably be one of the top, at least on, in, in my perspective, objective of keeping people and growing that people into the long-term kind of a, uh, sustainability. But that's a challenge, right? Because as a, a young company, you do inevitably generate a lot of camaraderie with the people that you've built the company with, right? The especially that, if you've gone through crisis. Yeah, yes. especially if you've gone through crisis, right? So I think that's kind of the challenge in that, like, how do you know, like, these are very difficult conversations to have, which is how do you know that your friend isn't scaling? Like, how do you know that this person that, you know, you've built some truly great stuff with, um, actually is no longer fit to take it to the next. I'll take yeah. that one step further. Yeah. What if you realize that you yes. yourself yeah. Yeah. Are, not are not scaling? Yeah. And, 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 and this is kind of, you know, this kind of mythology of the all, all powerful they founder, my God. Yeah. you know, like, and, and all this stuff. But the, I think what people out there need to know is the systemic insecurity that all founders and senior manager yeah. leaders have when they are confronted with the fact that Wow, I am possibly not the best. If, if I ask myself the question, am I, be, am I the best person in the world to be leading this company? The answer is probably invariably no, <laughs> right? Mm. It's probably invariably no. Um, and, and I think that asking that question keeps you in check mm -hmm. constantly. Because there are situations where you just can't fire yourself. Right? <laughs> it's very hard to fire yourself. And, and, yeah. and I think that's when, you know, that's when you start thinking of hiring and recruitment as a way of filling in those gaps. But then the key challenge is then letting go fully that mm -hmm. function to those people who you think are better than you, right? Uh, but I think that the systemic insecurity is something that a lot of our listeners, they don't, they don't really, they don't see it as yep. much or they don't realize how much we realize that we are totally, uh, <laughs> not not qualified to be doing this mm -hmm. and I'm sure we're gonna have another podcast uh, soon just on the role of luck yeah. and serendipity yeah. which I think is a yeah, super yeah, important super topic yeah. uh, that that we should discuss too many founders and companies are taking credit for luck I yeah, think that's yeah. my pet peeve yep. um, yeah and, and, and <laughs> totally. I think we need to straighten that out totally but guys we've run out of time uh, thank you for for today's first podcast we completed it and uh, we'll see you. <laughs> we'll see you. <laughs> we'll see you in the next one. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks. Hey guys, hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you liked it, please hit like, subscribe, and follow us on social media. Thanks so much for tuning in.